internets. It is Matt here for the Dork Lords with my good friend Dave Dalt. Hello. We're back talking a little Star Wars. Uh, mainly, uh, this is more for us. Yeah. Really, but, but if you want to <laughs> listen in, that's great too. Uh, we try to make it enjoyable for the listener. Today, um, our topic is... We, we, we kind of threw back and forth what some ideas for the, our topic of the day might be. And the topic is... Um, uh, least helpful characters. <laughs> okay, so we're talking here, the criteria is a major character. Yes. Um, probably, that. I mean, it, it's trying to help either the rebellion or the resistance. Yeah. The conv- you know, on the protagonist side. Yeah. That is, you know, central. Mm-hmm. Yet, if you really think about it, not particularly helpful. Yeah, and, and by central, I want to also kind of say they keep bringing the character in. And they keep shoehorning the character in, and you're not sure why. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, so, and just to, you know, again, laying the criteria out right off the bat, somebody listening might be like, oh, well, of course, Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar Binks. Right? But no, Jar Jar Binks actually doesn't meet the criteria, these particular criteria. Is Jar Jar Binks an annoying character that was a mistake and probably cost every scene he's in? Yes. Yes. <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> so that that's a different, that's a different topic. Yes. Uh, we're not saying necessarily a character that is portrayed poorly. Right. In fact, the character that I'm not going to mention who I've got yet, but the character that I've chosen, I like the character. <laughs> Actually, I'm like, go, go, character. But this particular character, when I really thought about it, hasn't really done a lot to help the cause. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, for instance, Jar Jar, you know, while he is, as I mentioned, blech, bad <laughs> character, he actually is at least marginally helpful. He, uh, um... You know, brings he's the liaison with the Gungans. Yeah. The Gungans fight in the war against the droid army. Yes. Through his clumsiness and weird accidental stuff, uh, Jar Jar kind of single-handedly takes out a ton of the droid army. Right. Uh, he also has the secret way uh, through the underwater passage to Oh, get that's right, when they're Obi-Wan like Obi-Wan and, and, and all that. Yeah, so, yeah. So he's, he has, he is helpful to the rebellion, yeah, while still being a, an incredibly annoying character, yeah, but also arguably central to the story. I mean, right. the, the the story can't kind of can't happen without him, and for better or for worse, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. So anyway, so that's why Jar Jar is not on. Uh, I assume he's not on your selection, Mm-mm. and he's uh, he's not on mine either, right? So uh, so yes, with that in mind, our least helpful characters in Star Wars. Also, another criteria I should say is we're sticking to the movies, yeah. So yeah. the, I guess that would also include Rogue One and Solo, but the the movies, not necessarily the other, uh, the animated shows or books or something like that. Exactly. Um, so with that in mind, uh, take it away. Your choice for least helpful major character, Mr. Dalton. C-3PO. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, prove it to me, sir. Well, so, I, so... Poor C three PO. Let's let's <laughs> let's argue. Let's argue first of all for the things that that C three PO is doing kind of right. Um, okay. And and so in in a New Hope, the whole role of R two D two and C three PO is kind of the Abbott and Costello, the the kind of buddy character, the long skinny one and the short fat one. Sure. It's a it's a Bert and Ernie kind of dynamic. And 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 in fact, if you think about Bert as the kind of elongated yellow one. <laughs> uh, uh, exactly, and so Ernie is the chaos monster. Bert is the order monster, or the chaos muppet. Bert's the order muppet. Oh, sure. Well, we could go down this road, and, yeah. and I'll let you do your thing first. Yeah. But the the clowning thing of like the white face versus the red nose clown. Yeah, we can, I'll I'll bring up yeah. some points about that later. But go for it, sir. And right. but but I mean, so so there are clear story and structural dynamics that uh, in a new hope. R2-D2 and C-3PO are playing, and they play it amazingly well. Like, I love the interaction in A New Hope, and they're fantastic. And within the, even the original trilogy, I am, I am a fan of the dynamic of C-3PO. Okay. But, and, and this, (laughs) and I really like, I I really, I really like your theory about the way that the droids are the immortal witnesses to all the events. I think that that's kind of brilliant. Uh, So I do like the idea of having the droids be in there and be kind of a constant part of the story. I just wish that there wasn't the need to try and make them kind of 
these droids a personal part of the story because okay, okay so in in now the 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 original trilogy they they have this buddy dynamic and it really works well in a new hope it kind of it's kind of played out by by uh <laughs> return of the jedi um <laughs> all right there i mean there are some good moments in return of the jedi where c3po is is the god right. and treated like that like that's that's fun and and i still see that character to the Ewoks. Yeah, that character is having a a kind of usefulness in that in in that trilogy in then the kind of phantom menace moving forward the fact that now uh these droids and in particular c3po are are kind of shoehorned in and r2d2 is bad enough and r2d2 kind of i mean but i would i would even say just now that you've brought this up I think I could make a much stronger case that R two D two is significantly more helpful and yeah. useful to the rebellion yeah. than C three PO. Oh yeah, and I mean, so R two D two is the vessel of the plans, you know, pilots spaceships. Yes. can hack into the Death Star. Yes, uh, I think even attack. He, he attacks folks occasionally. Yes, yes. So let's know, let's folks, let's yeah. just say across the board that it, within the world of Star Wars, astromech droids. <laughs> are much better than protocol droids across the board, okay? Gotcha. Fine. Um, but, if, you know, talk to me about kind of what C-3PO is doing in then the the kind of prequel trilogy. Like, besides being a weird retcon of, like, this was Anakin's droid and Anakin built, mm. yeah, mm. C-3PO, mm. but then doesn't recognize C-3PO later... Well, there's that big issue, obviously. Or maybe with, does uh, when Obi Wan doesn't claims not yeah, to recognize claims not to recognize. Yeah. yeah, but okay. But there's a, there's there's that also that weird thing in Empire Strikes Back where C three PO gets demolished, right, and then has to be put back together. Why was C three PO demolished? And what I mean is there some sort of weird kind of thing of like Darth Vader doesn't want C three PO to? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but. I, Okay. But but if you if you then think back to what they did in the prequel trilogy about now making like C-3PO is not just a participant in this universe, but C-3PO is like directly involved with this family and was Anakin's hobby kit. That's <laughs> like what what does that do for the story, first of all? And then if you think about what that does for the story, what does that do for the character? Like C-3PO no longer has C-3PO's arc that that under underscores the overall themes as its own arc. C-3PO is now completely in service to this arc of Anakin. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't do justice to what's happening in the, in the, the original trilogy. I mean, the dynamic there is its own dynamic, like C-3PO and R2-D2 have their own kind of relationship. And as that relationship plays out, it plays out parallel to, but not necessarily under underscoring, you know, the main characters. They're they're involved, but they're but they aren't completely beholden to these main characters. That complete in the in the prequel trilogy, that completely gets upended. I think one of the things that uh you know, if you were to pick uh C3PO's greatest skill set, yes. It's probably his ability to speak millions of languages. Sure. So that, on its face, sounds really useful. It does, doesn't it? But it really doesn't come into play. I think the the best case scenario, the most helpful that it, it is, is probably, as you mentioned, when he, in the, with the Ewoks. Yeah, but... He can talk to the Ewoks, and he convinces them to help. I think he's probably, the, the at least the interpreter, yeah. that is able to convince them to help them fight. But other than that, I think it's maybe just because cinematically they're like, oh, we can speak languages... But we want to show a fight scene. But this is a universe where everybody speaks Wookiee and I know, several people point. speak Greedo. That was yeah. my point was like people speak Wookiee. People speak to R2. Yeah. People can speak the language of Astromex. So, yeah, it's it's a world where he's not needed that much. Right. And so they didn't, you know, the they didn't shoehorn in a whole lot of a, a chances for him to be helpful right. via speech. Right. You know, he talks for Jabba. Well, great. I don't know. Like that's not helpful necessarily. He's just like I'm interpreting the villain. <laughs> ah, da, 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 da. Um, so yeah, it, it's, because it's important in this universe that good guys don't speak villain. 
Right. They don't speak villain. They speak <laughs> astromech and Wookiee. Uh, um, but, you know, it kind of reminds me, this might be a little off topic, but it kind of reminds me of, um, you know, I play a little uh, D&D back in the day. No. No. Never <laughs> did. Uh, man, I got a rep to protect. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so one of the things about that game is, um, and you learn this even as a dungeon master, and you can exploit this. Roll D6 for but, reputation. <laughs> Um, but it, it's so in other words, let's say um, you want to uh, give a party member, you want to give a character something that on its face seems cool and they're going to be happy with, but actually isn't really that effective at all. Mm -hmm. So you make it really specific. You're like, oh, well, here's a here's a ring of preventing thunderstorms <laughs> on Tuesdays. <laughs> In slightly inclement weather. You're like, oh, my God, check it out. I got this magic ring. Yeah, it doesn't do anything that's ever going to come into play. Yeah. Or it's fine. Yeah. And so it's kind of the same idea with, like, I have this great ability to speak millions of languages. Yeah, but it's not really going to come in handy yeah. almost ever. Yeah. So, uh, yay. <laughs> it's it's not it's not a useful skill like plus three weirdness magnet. Let's right. Be, yeah. Yes. Obviously, that would be incredibly <laughs> useful. All right. So. I, just on the notion of the the clown thing, I did yes. want to mention oh, this. Oh, yeah, bring in the clowns. Send, <laughs> in, the Send clowns. in the clowns. Um, as you mentioned that, it kind of reminded me of uh, C-3PO, I think, is like in the Commedia. I'm going to go out on my skis a little Commedia bit. Commedia dell'arte? Bring Comedia it. Del bring Art. it. Okay. You're talking my language All now. Right. So... In that tradition, it's an old, it's a French clowning tradition that got brought into Italy as well. But in any case, there are very specific character t archetypes that are uh, used again and again, and they have names and they have traits. Yeah. And those traits change over time, but for the most part, they have pretty specific, uh, you know, tunnel, uh, an archetype. Folks at home who are fans of David Bowie's Scary Monsters album. On Scary Monsters, he is dressed up as Piero, well, one of the clowns. Funny you should mention that, because yeah. that's the guy that I think is C-3PO. Okay. See, the Piero character, here are, the, here are the traits, typically, of the Piero character. Bring it. Uh, he's almost always a servant, mm. right? So I think that that applies. C-3PO is built to serve He humans. buttles. He's a... He's, he's a, a buttle. He's buttle. a buttle. Um, Piero is typically naive. mm or plays kind of the fool. Mm. Um, and you also, a lot of people tend to play pranks on him. Mm. Now, we don't see necessarily a ton of pranks, but we do see, you know, for instance, you mentioned he gets scrapped and then he's on uh, Chewie's back and gets he's his head to put on backwards. Head, yeah. He's, you know, yeah, head put on backwards. He's got a different arm. He, whatever. Like, yeah. He, he, he kind of goes through a series of, woe is me type <laughs> things. But the, the one of the more defining traits about Piro yes. is he's sad. He's a sad clown. He's mm. sad and he's a pessimist pretty much. Yeah. And I feel like there is, if you really think about it, like C-3PO is a pessimist. Oh, yeah. And he's kind of sad. Like he, he always has like worst case scenario about everything. So Bert fits and in this too, it, in the Muppet world. Yeah, Bert, Bert is a Piro character. I never understood that. But the thing is that uh, the Piro character also is typically not effective. Like things happen to Piro. Piro's kind of the butt of the joke, but is not actually the, the protagonist. He's not going to go save the day. He's right. Not gonna, he's, you know, he's, <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a pathetic, uh, you know, character really. Yeah. And uh, so I feel like in a lot of ways, C-3PO embodies that character, and maybe it was even an inspiration, I don't know, but the idea of, like, here are these clowns. Um, now, Piro doesn't wear a mask. Piro usually is with a white face. Right. But he is in a mask tradition. It kind of makes me think of the uh, the robots might, might even fit into that category. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think you could, if I was writing an essay, I think I could do a pretty strong essay of C-3PO equals Piro. Mm -hmm. And this gets to the point of what I'm trying to say. Like, within a story... A good story, particularly a good filmic story, has a structure, which means that every character that's in it plays off of a dynamic and is in is can be fit into a role, not in terms of a character role, but in terms of a structural role of 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 what that character is doing to move the story along. I feel like in the original trilogy, particularly in A New Hope, within the story, 
C-3PO and R2-D2 play a structural role okay. that is very useful to the story and the dynamic of their comedic interplay is useful for us in seeing the stakes of the rest of the seriousness in its proper light. Um, you know, because their squabbles with one another help us to realize that there are certain enmities and certain rivalries that are inconsequential and others that will literally destroy the universe. Also, I, I thought what's a really cool point, so one of the first times we see them is on the desert. I mean, right. You know, and they're C-3O's complaining about the yeah. desert. Um, and what I think I, the first time I saw that scene, yeah. um, I appreciated that it's a world where robots complain to each other when no one else is around. Yeah. Like, like you think of it as like a machine that I turn it off. It's, it's <laughs> off and it just does what I want. But the fact that the machine is actually thinking and, and having feelings about their environments and talking to other robots and not, you know, there's no one around, no humans uh, influencing their chat. Like that was kind of a fun idea. I mean, yeah. I, it's been done so many times now, but I think back in the t back in the day in the seventies, it wasn't necessarily a, as common a, a trope maybe as we see nowadays. The idea that yeah, what what do the robots do when humans aren't around? Yeah, oh, they're they're talking to each other, having a conversation. That was kind of a, a cool uh, I don't know moment for me. It's like a little put you into that world of like this is a world where mm -hmm. robots have opinions. Yeah, and talk to each other. So let me ask you then. The relationship, if you see any, between C-3PO as a character that does that and a character like Marvin the Paranoid Android in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. Mm. So Marvin takes that notion of the complaining robot and literally dials it up to 11. <laughs> He's definitely a, a sad clown. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Uh, Alan Rickman. Oh. Mm. Anyway. Um, rest in peace. Uh, so, okay, so what do you... You're saying what? Are, what are your? What are you asking? Well, so I'm 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 asking. So you know, for comedic effect, Douglas Adams takes that idea of the complaining robot and makes it kind of central as a way not of serving the structure of the story, but instead making a comment on kind of human culture. Right. Um. And so, in that sense, how how are the robots in this particular case in Star Wars helping us to understand the human? interactions or human culture generally we're asked the question i think is the audience yeah are we supposed to worry for the safety of these robots are it's they a, yeah you know, are do you know it seems like in a lot of times the the main characters kind of they do and they don't yeah you know at various times they're worried about them at times but they're like oh it's a it's a robot i don't know <laughs> yeah um uh, oh the restraining bolts okay uh, you know they're slaves essentially right mm -hmm. um so yeah, I, I guess, I guess there is a thought of like, you know, we're the intention of say George Lucas is to say, yeah, these, uh, these are not just tools. Yeah, you know, these are sentient beings mm -hmm. that deserve more respect than they're getting in this particular society. Yeah, um, and obviously you can you can extrapolate that to inequities in. In modern life, mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think um, I think we're I think we're intended to see them as, in some ways, very you know, put upon un a, a universe that is unfair to them. Yes, and they are surviving in that world. Going to get really nerdy now. Okay, okay. In Asimov, robots play a role within the universe of Asimov that is similar to the role that mutants play within the Marvel universe. Okay. Okay. So they're, they're the outcasts. They, they are part of society. They function within society and yet they're hated and they're, they're pushed aside. Okay. On the opposite end, you have someone like Douglas Adams where robots are fully integrated into the universe society as equals, even to the point that you have kind of an Eeyore character who is, I mean, in the same way that Eeyore is accepted completely by uh, the Hundred Acre Woods gang <laughs> uh, and, and is allowed to be mopey, you have, you have Marvin the Paranoid Android who is, you know, part of everything and is not castigated for me. Somewhere in the middle is the Star Wars universe. So I take what you're saying, but it's not the Asimov hated, shunned, and it's not the fully accepted. It's somewhere in between, isn't it? I agree in that I think it's, you know... 
at the core, I think Lucas was trying to do something along the lines of Flash Gordon. Okay. Kind of a, you know, like an, an old serial, sci-fi serial action thing. Yeah. And so, you know, he only had so much space to carve out for, like, a topic maybe that deep. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, okay, we'll have these robots that are that are slave robots, but we also had to do, you but know, we've shoot. Had 40 and lasers years and- now to think about. <laughs> and we also know that he, he gave so much thought to story structure. He gave so much thought to kind of source and and all of the material that he brought into this. So in that sense, we could say he didn't give that much thought to it, but he gave so much thought to it. And so, you know, it kind of kind of yes, but no. I want <laughs> yes, to no. I want to agree but disagree with that's you. That's good. Uh, that's good improv technique. <laughs> uh, yes, but no. That's that's what you learn after yes and. It's like you are wise now. You have attained a true improv enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, no, but okay. So from yes. a certain point of view. From a certain point of view. <laughs> Um, all right, so so yeah, uh, elaborate, sir. So you're saying um, you would prefer it to be more in depth, is what you're saying? Well, I, uh, so I would prefer if if what you're saying is true that in that desert scene in A New Hope, we see the robots as having an independent relational life of their own, which I think is a brilliant point. And we're supposed to care about these characters. So at the end of Star Wars, R2 is fried. And he gets, you know, I've lost right. R2. I've lost R2. I've lost R2. That was the, probably the moment of all moments where we see a human care for... Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then when R2 is pulled out, you know, fix this guy because he he's worth a lot to me. He, yeah. he matters to me. And then at the end, when R2 is like bouncing back and forth in the awards scene, that's an emotional payoff. We had a fear about R2, and now R2 is back. Great. Okay. If that's the case, if if these are supposed to have independent emotional lives and relationships and we're supposed to care about them. I think the answer is yes. Then taking the prequel trilogy and subverting that independence wholly for the sake of the main characters mm. so that they no longer have – I would have loved to have seen a B story – of these droids and how they actually end up becoming enmeshed in gotcha. the universe instead of just oh he got built yeah I, I you know and this is this is my wider problem with the entire Star Wars universe it shouldn't be about that one family like everything doesn't it's way too small it's way too small yeah you want to have you want to have these characters have independent lives apart from and not in service to the A story that that's good storytelling like the if you if you think about how cinematic stories are put together, a B story is designed to underscore the theme of the first story, but to show how those characters are making decisions that are in service to the greater theme of the story, but how their different decisions end up kind of changing the outcomes that the main characters end up getting right. And so seeing seeing that that B story of the droids and how, you know, how R2-D2 and C-3PO come to meet randomly as opposed to kind of being built next to each other. And I would compare it to uh, Rogue One, yeah. the the droid voiced by uh, Alan Tydic. Oh, so good. Uh, so he was obviously once, you know, a slave to the Empire. Yeah. He's, he's restraining bold. His, his programming is undone or whatever. And yes. now he somewhat seems like he has freedom of choice. Yes. He's choosing to work at odds with the empire yes uh and sacrifices himself ultimately yeah you know that was uh, and so in that case not a pro character because obviously mm-hmm. has agency obviously can be heroic mm-hmm. and yet has the kind of moroseness that is so in that sense he's that character is embodying both r2d2 and c3po in one character fantastic i love things like that and again completely like you know that that character has its own trajectory and and in having that trajectory, that makes the story all the stronger because this independent trajectory kind of builds and and gives presence to the main trajectory of the A story. Right, right. And you you know, like there's a moment as you were talking about this, I was thinking to myself, is maybe it's that R2 and C3PO are almost like a Greek chorus, mm. like observing and commenting on what's happening, but they're not. They're not. They're, they're so in the story. Yeah. They are a, they are main characters in the story. Yeah. They, they can't really step outside and comment on it. Yeah. Uh, so that's not really a, an apt analogy. I mean, you could you could 
you could make that if you were maybe George Lucas, you're like, I want these guys to be the commentary on this. Yeah. Somehow have them outside the action or, yeah, you know, but, not be, but they are, no, they're too central to what's happening. And, but what you're doing is, is you're, you're showing exactly how old and how deep this kind of concept of story, story structure is. Like if you're going to have uh, a meta commentary within a story, it has to play a certain role and there are limitations on how that role can function. And so these characters are doing something within the story that is structural. And the problem that I have is that is that they, you know, once you get to the prequel series, they've messed with the structure. They've they've blocked the structure. The artery of the structure is blocked and it's not able to do what it's supposed to do. Is there a scene other than I mean, it sounds like you're specifically pointing to the fact that which I agree is a like uh, kind of a sigh moment when you see that An young Anakin is building C three PO. Yeah, is there another moment in the prequels that that stands out? Well, for you? I, I actually to to really underscore this, I want to get to uh, I, I want to get to the now the the trilogy that we're in. And again, the the terminology is so weird to me. So there's the original trilogy, trilogy. there's the prequel, prequel. trilogy. Like, trilogy and now we're in the sequel, the trilogy. sequel trilogy and we're and so the second film of the sequel trilogy okay yeah. last jedi last jedi um so look at what c-3po is doing in that film okay i don't think they do much right no There's a scene yeah it's exactly like, eh, we got him yeah cameo done yeah and and so r2d2 has been turned off all this time but we don't really have an emotional investment oh, that's in true that. they, they're seen a little bit more yeah than, okay he has and, a couple of lines he's yeah, on low power mode he's on and 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 so what are the droids doing there you know what 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 are they doing for the story there that couldn't be done by some other means you know gotcha. they they have no story arc of their own now but they have to be together somehow, and they have to care about each other somehow. But oh. but they also have to be antagonistic. So somehow. you're saying it's they've almost become like a story trap. Yeah, what you're saying like they're, you're like oh we gotta write these guys in. Okay, yeah. how do we fit them? And in? that and that really that so it begins to happen in the prequel trilogy. It is now in full bloom in the sequel trilogy. I got you. They have no structural purpose. The old dynamic between them is dead embers. Like if they if they bicker, so what? You know, because they have no independence now, we don't care about the bickering other than, oh, they're supposed to bicker. But that's... and, and It's built into my programming. Yeah. And so of, of the two, R2 is still functioning because at least, you know, R2, again, was the vessel of secret information at one point. Still is. I mean, let's yeah. face it. R2, while well, it's in low power mode, basically what we're saying is R2 has the... The answer. Code, the answer to Luke's location yeah. has been in the Resistance headquarters yes. for years, yes. years, kept that secret. Yeah. In, in, like, the most difficult place to keep that secret, Yes, R2 has doggedly kept that secret the yeah. entire time. And no one like, thought to put a restraining bolt on R2 and turn him back on <laughs> and force him to, re to release the... Out of what? Out of filial honor to Luke? What? I, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that was a, that's quite. A, I, I give R two credit. Talk frankly. about talk about freaking J J Abrams mystery box. <laughs> yeah. I, so again, I I think you know the the difficulty that happens with storytelling and and any if you read any book on cinematic storytelling, they'll tell you that this is the trap. You end up looking at the formula and thinking that the formula is what makes a good story, mm. not actual character development within a structure. I like that. Yeah, and so That's a good point. And Forest so, and trees. Yeah, it, yeah, and so what we've got right now is we have an assumption that C three PO and R two D two need to be playing a role somehow, but there's no role for them because the story doesn't call for them. What the story would call for would be for them to have their own independent relationship and storyline just like they do at the beginning of new hope and as they do you know the fact that the fact that there's antagonism in their desire you know what does c-3po want in the desert what does r2d2 want in the desert they're in conflict and that conflict makes for an interesting story and right, so right the you restraining know, bolts taken off r2 heads for obi-wan heads for obi-wan c-3po didn't he's like wait what wait whoa wait. yeah exactly and so not until they are attacked by the sand people do they begin to have common purpose again. And even then, you can see antagonism between them, mm -hmm. you know. And so 
that's interesting storytelling. They want different things. And you are clear that they want different things, but you don't know what they are. And you're interested in finding out why this droid wants to go this way and this droid wants to go this way. And in terms of the unfolding of the story, that antagonism plays into the wider conflicts of the story. Should Luke stay on the planet? Should Luke join the resistance? You know, should Obi-Wan help? Should he not? All of these folks are making A to B choices about their direction. And so this B story of the droids underscores the the bigger theme of the film. It works organically. That's great. There is none of that in the sequel trilogy. There's less of that in the prequel trilogy. You get the best of that in the original trilogy. But what is C-3PO doing now in the story? Why, why is C-3PO there? I can't answer that question, and it's bad storytelling. Uh, other than the fans want him and they need to sell more toys, which is bad reasoning to put a character in a film. I hear you. Okay. I hear you. Yep. Okay. So so you've allowed me to go on now for way too long about C-3PO, but now I'm really interested in who it is that you would. Da, 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 da. All right. So mine is not uh, maybe quite as deep. Oh. I mean, mine is more like I'm just I just look at those story beats uh-huh. and this person's actions the totality of this person's actions haven't really helped, uh, you know, helped, uh, in this case, the resistance. Okay. Along. Okay. So this particular, <laughs> the character I'm going to bring up. I want to know. <clears throat> is Finn. It's Finn. Now, I like Finn. You've done this before. I love this. Bring it, bring it, bring it. All right. It. And so I'm not going to go, I'm not going to rehash stuff that I've talked no, about before. No, but this is awesome. I love where this. I, had I an, love I had this. An, I, had an, I had my fanfic what if you did this with Finn? And, yeah. And so I'm not actually going to cover that again. Okay. Um, but yeah, let's, so uh, again, again, this is, I like Finn. Yeah. Like character. Yeah. Like potential for Finn. The fact that he's a former stormtrooper, really cool backstory. Yes. Element. Okay. But if you start looking at what Finn accomplishes uh-huh. in, okay, we only have two movies to look at. We don't have as many films as C-3PO. Yet. Yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, he doesn't really accomplish a lot. So, mm-hmm. okay. Uh, Force Awakens. He's a stormtrooper. Yes. In the beginning. Yes. So we can assume he hasn't helped the resistance too much until that point. No. Um, he, you know, decides I'm out. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's Poe that helps him escape. Yes. More than helps, flies him to safety. Sure, he shoot. he's on the ship and he shoots a few stormtroopers, but it, if the ship doesn't take off, they're dead. Yeah. Ship takes off. Poe gets him to Jakku. Uh, crash lands on Jakku. Uh, now he's just trying to find safety or trying to find a, 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 a village. He's in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Just like uh, C-3PO. And so uh, he goes, uh, you know, go, finds, kind of runs into Ray, uh, sees BB-8, and um, in his, he is attempting to save Ray at some at some point because he realizes there's an attack happening. But in some ways, Ray really saves him. Yeah. Right. She gets she's the pilot of the Millennium Falcon. He's again shooting, <laughs> but it's also funny how the gun sticks in one place, and so she flies it well enough that he doesn't even have to aim. He just has to push a button, and he goes, "Hey, we did it!" Like it's always how a woman is helping a man to compensate. Yeah. I, very, yeah. yeah perfect. So there's perfect. a lot of ideology we can bring into that. <laughs> a lot. I love what they're doing with this sequel right. trilogy. Right. But so point being, it's more of a Ray thing yes. than, a, than a Finn thing. Yes. Okay. So um, from there, uh, they meet up with Han Solo. And he, uh, Finn is uh, captured by the Raftar, you know, uh-huh. the, 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 the tentacle, and is dragging him. Ray closes the door, cuts off the tentacle, saves Finn again. Yes. Uh, then they go to Maz Kanata's castle. Finn's like, you know what? I need to get out of here. Yeah. Kind of says goodbye, but it, before he can leave, the planet's attacked. Yes, he kills a couple of storm. He kills at least one stormtrooper with a lightsaber. Yes. But then he's in a fight with his former comrade, uh-huh. traitor. Yeah. About to get killed by him. Yeah. Han Solo saves him. Yeah. Uh, then uh, he's with the Resistance, and they're like, we need a plan. We got to go to Starkiller Base. He wants to go to rescue Ray. Yes. So he pretends to know stuff. Sure, I can get us in there. Can't really. Right. I would depend on the Force. Uh, gets get They go to Starkiller Base. And here's where maybe you could argue he has the most, he, he is the most helpful. Yeah. In that... With the help of Han and Chewie, he convinces Captain Phasma to drop the shields. Yeah. I would argue that Han and Chewie could probably have figured that out on their own. First of all, Captain Phasma is not uh, 
subtle. No. I think you could pick out who's the leader of the stormtroopers in this. Oh, the one with the giant chrome outfit. <laughs> All right. You drop the shields. Okay. Um, and it's not it's not the presence of of uh, Finn in that case that makes her drop the shields. Right. She's just like, okay, fine. Um, so that's still that's more of a you know, Han and Chewie definitely have a big part to play in that. Right. Uh then uh Finn witnesses Han uh, be killed. Yes. Uh, and has a, a lightsaber duel with Kylo Ren. Mm -hmm. Brave. Yes. But he gets his butt kicked. Yes. And it, it looks like he may even be dead. I mean, he's severely hurt, unconscious, out. Yes. That's his That's his effect in, in Force Awakens. Yeah. So really, the only thing maybe is this drop in the shields, but he doesn't do that on his own. He's with two very capable people who've done basically that same thing before. Mm -hmm. mm. So, okay. So then you cut to the this last Jedi. He's, you know, gets out of his coma. He almost immediately undertakes this plan to go to Canto Bight. Right. He's, I'm going to get the code breaker and we're going to solve this problem. Okay. Right. That whole mission is a complete failure. I mean, it really doesn't, it doesn't accomplish anything for the resistance. Right. We, they find Benicio del Toro. They, Benicio del Toro actually gives them up. Mm -hmm. And their plan is actually not beneficial to the resistance. The resistance has its own plan. And Admiral Holdo is like, "Hey, we're gonna drop off at this. Uh, we're gonna, you know, little decoy move, and we're gonna go to this planet." The the Canto Bite mission is kind of a dead end. Well, a dead end within the story, but not a dead end for the story. Okay. So keep going. All right. All right. So I'm just saying, in that situation, I don't feel like that Canto Bite mission. I thought you're gonna. You're going to say in the long run it helps the resistance because there's a little kid with the sweepy sweep. But, but also okay. structurally within the story, okay. I mean, so in in terms of so there's there's the 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 diagesis where where the characters are interacting with events within the story, and then there's the way that those events within the story serve the larger structure of the story. Okay, and that's that's the. That's a different question. But All right, keep let me, going let me polish that. So the, did, I'm almost done with the the narrative here for the lack of ability. So he uh, he does potentially kill Captain Phasma. We're not sure if she's dead, but she falls into fire. But they haven't really utilized that character yet. Yes, so I would argue that Captain Phasma is more an enemy for him. Yeah, it's his own personal yeah foe as opposed to this major threat to the resistance. Right. You know, just she's just she's another she's an officer. Yeah. In the in a giant army. Yeah. But to Finn, it's important. Yes. All right. So his own little personal battle, fine. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't think it really helps the resistance that much in that okay. situation. Um, then he decides I'm gonna knock out the big cannon that's gonna blow up the 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 door to the base. Mm -hmm. But before he can do it, he's you know Rose saves him. Yep. Knocks him out of the way, and that's it. That's the end of his. Of his actions for those two movies, I would say the only the only real, you know, effects that he has in the moment are connected to Captain Phasma, mm -hmm. uh, which again I think is more of a personal foe than a larger resistance foe. Okay, so if you pulled Finn out of the story entirely, what what would suffer in the story? Well, I mean, you have his relationships with Poe and Ray. Okay, right. I mean, he. Has interactions with them. Potential think, bromance, potential romance. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so I guess those are the main the main things. Okay. Uh, as far as I can tell, it sounds like you've got an idea for no, that. No, I'm or? I'm I'm sort of I'm I'm feeling because. So what I was saying is again, I like the character. I think he does add something to the to the story. But as a, but, but in terms of his effectiveness as I'm a resistance member and yeah. I'm going to help the resistance, I feel like. The resistance could have probably gotten along without him. But let, let's map this on to my kind of C-3PO critique. Okay. So there's a missed opportunity, which you've pointed out before. Right, right. About a trajectory and interests that this character, Finn, could have. Just really quickly, I won't go you know, yeah. big in depth, but he's a former stormtrooper. He decides to break out of that cycle. We learn that they are raised from birth, practically, to be automaton soldiers. Yeah. The fact that he now has this ability to break that cycle and could theoretically have compassion for stormtroopers that are still in that situation. Bow, student, stormtrooper, messiah. Exactly, yeah. And and so the fact that he kind of wantonly goes and kills 
I say wantonly. That's a, wantonly. That's a strong term. <laughs> but he kills a bunch of stormtroopers yes. in his efforts to escape and such. Um, it just got. It would be more interesting if he was trying to save stormtroopers. Yeah. That he doesn't see the stormtroopers as the problem. He sees them as an effect of this greater problem, the cause of which is this this uh, you know empire. Yeah. Uh, and so that would be a much more I think interesting thing for him to do instead of just now he's in the resistance and so now I just I can shoot stormtroopers and they're the enemy and fine. Like uh, I it would be a cooler topic if he led a resistance movement within stormtrooper. Yeah. That yeah. would be really, really cool. And, and so there's a potential for a story there and a potential for investment relationships and character arc that has been missed. And, and that's, you know, so in that sense, there, there's, there's a frustration that you feel that's hard to name because you feel like there's a better story that could be told. Mm, that's maybe true. And, and in, in, in avoiding telling that better story, the entire story is weakened. And that, I mean, that kind of speaks to the larger piece of this entire conversation about, you know, the, the characters, the characters are not there to serve the main story. The characters are there to serve their story, their interests, their conflicts. That's what makes it interesting to watch them, watching them work something out that is different from the main story that you're watching, but still parallel to it. And Finn is not robustly developed in that way. In this, in the same way that you know, there was the potential at the beginning, but now it has been um, flummoxed. It's it's sure. it's been bobbled. I really like what you're doing with this because I feel like there is, you know, there's a real question here about what this sequel trilogy is trying to do in terms of moving the story forward for the story, but also for the franchise, which also means for the merchandising. Mm. And those are not all in parallel. There are conflicting interests there too. So what do you have at the end of uh, The Last Jedi? You have children playing with toys. You do. You do. And what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty, it's not even subtle, right? Yeah, it's no. Like, we have toys you can play with and yeah. pretend to be the kids playing with toys in our movie. Yeah. And that's, I mean... You know, so now you have, you have, you have now several levels of this. So we in the meat world, and I've talked about the meat world the before, meat world. the world that you and I live in where, you know, consequences are real, you can get arrested for things, you know, and, and, and there's no force and spaceships don't fly like that. Like the meat world that we live in. We're watching this story Speak world. Speak for yourself. Spaceships, oh, man. Enough. We're doing this. All right, sorry. Yeah. We're watching this story world, technically the, the, the Diogesis, and the Diogesis has its own rules and its own physics and its own laws, and you watch the characters within that live by those rules, those physics, and those laws, and they're different from ours. We enjoy watching that story. You know, in the Avengers, Thor whips a hammer around and flies in the air. Doesn't happen in our world, but it's a fun story to watch. Uh, we don't have laser swords yet in our world. Um, we can't make rocks lift up, most of us, um, in our world. But it's fun watching that world. Okay, but now you have characters within that world now taking little characters themselves, little figurines, and now playing a diagesis within the diagesis where they're now playing stories within their world we're watching a story world where characters within the story are playing stories within their world, which is a parallel to what you and I did with our Star Wars figures. When we were, you know, eight, nine years old, we took these figures and we told new stories. It's funny. I didn't have a ton of characters. Yeah. I had C-3PO and R2-D2. Yeah. Interestingly yeah. enough. <laughs> But so in the same way that we're telling stories about this made up world that maybe don't match the laws of that world, they're now imagining new relationships, new laws, new physics within their story world. And and we're watching them do it. What will that mean for what is to come in the trilogies yet unwritten? You know, the Ryan trilogy and the other trilogies that are coming that we know are coming because they're planned and whatever. Sure. So we know that this universe is going to go on. And 
how are we setting up these characters to be good and useful stories within that wider sweep of things? Like, is this all just fan service now? Is this all just to sell little figurines in our world now? Is that what this story is for? Or are we going to get the kind of stories that actually made us give a crap like the original trilogy did? Like, I, I still will go to the mat about those first three films because they're so well crafted in not in terms of dialogue the dialogue sucks but in terms of the story the story structure was fantastic in spite of george lucas in spite of all the good work that he did he still didn't know how to tell the story the editors and the other writers helped him tell those stories in ways that still matter and speaking of literary references you know i think if we did that video yes. we'd have to Which bring up we will joseph campbell oh yeah hero of thousand faces oh yeah uh because that especially in the imprint of the first of the original trilogy yeah. that has the strongest resonance. And that speaks to the argument that I keep making is that Lucas knew that in order to really get across what he was trying to get across, he had to go with mythic structure, like the structure that is so old that it works. It works at our kind of DNA level. You know, he had to reach into our psyches and find a way to tweak us so that we would really respond to this film. And he did it like it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and you're saying you're suggesting perhaps that uh, uh, that structure has been diluted now in the interest of marketing and uh... and also I think J.J. Abrams suffers from a species of the same problem that Lucas suffers from. He he gets he gets distracted by the the crinoline and the the filigree around the story, and he misses the story. Well, to bring it to what you were saying originally, yeah. all right, got to stick C-3PO and R2-D2 in here somewhere. Yeah. Where yeah. do we stick them? All yeah. right. Oh, we'll do this. And we'll da, 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 da. All right. That's check check that box off. So got it. in Alias. At some point, we have to say, I have a bad feeling about this. Yeah. All right, who says that? Somebody has okay. to lose an arm. Yeah. 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 Okay. So so J.J. Abrams. Let's take Alias, the kind of er J.J. Abrams where he had creative control and was really kind of running the show. My wife loved the series. Oh, yeah. A lot uh, of people love yeah. the series. But... But J.J. Abrams, undiluted by other writers and other showrunners, is a bad combination. And so there's a moment where in Alias, they're running, and the female character, I can't remember her name. Um, sure. Yeah, but she she points, because they need to get out of a situation fast, so they need a car, and she points across a parking lot, and she yells, Ford F-150. And they run to the Ford F-150, and they get into it, and they peel away, and it solves their problem. Okay. What is that? Well, that's marketing placement. Like they've just, they've just placed a product within the film that then other people can be like, oh, that could solve my problem too. It's a kind of a deus ex machina, which means that it solves the problem without really being organic to the story. And it kind of comes from nowhere. And it's almost, it's like, oh, of course there's going to be a Ford F-150 there to help us peel away. Finn, C-3PO, in this sequel series, they're playing the Ford F-150 role <laughs> here where they, they're they getting stuff done because the storytellers are either incompetent or too lazy to actually do the good storytelling that would do the heavy lifting to get that stuff done. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. I have a... Uh, pushback if you need to No, push it's not back. a pushback. It's a uh, somewhat tangential. I might be running a little off topic, but it's a similar idea to this marketing thing. Jennifer I've, Garner was her name. Sorry. Yeah, for, yeah. I thought you were talking about the character. Sorry. No, sorry. Yeah, okay. I, I, I yes, didn't yeah, know who I, I was talking about. But okay. I, the, the female lead, Jennifer Garner, yes. I don't remember her name. It's been a long time since I've watched Alias. Um, so I had a buddy who was, he did some digital editing work for a couple of movies. Sure. One of the movies he worked on back in the day was um, Inspector Gadget. Oh. The live action version. Uh, with Matthew Broderick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I didn't see the movie. I I, <laughs> I, I, I assume it's not very good. Oh, I, no. Anyway. But so, his work was amazing. His work was great. Yes, this <laughs> editing was great. Anyway, but I, um, I was told that, I guess there's a scene in, uh, the, the, McDonald's is a sponsor of the movie. Sure. Okay. So there's a scene apparently where Inspector Gadget goes and he orders a, he's, he's in McDonald's. Mm -hmm. There's a scene happens in McDonald's. And so the the the, sh the movie production time like got a little long, and they, they longer than expected. And so by the time the movie was going to come out, the he had Matthew Broderick, Inspector Gadget had ordered a meal that was going to be like the highlighted McDonald's meal for that month. Well, it was no longer the the highlighted meal, 
So they had to go back and reshoot. So the Inspector Gadget name dropped the right merchandise. Yeah. And I mean, it was hugely expensive to go back and reshoot all that stuff and redo it so that I mentioned the Chicken McNuggets instead of the whatever, the Shamrock Shake or whatever the hell it was. Uh, but, you know, so that's one of those moments of like where the marketing is much more important than the actual who cares what the movie is. Blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Did you mention McNuggets? Yeah. You didn't. Damn it. Do it again. Yeah. Now, let's be honest, those kinds of deals are how these major blockbuster films get made. Sure. And it's wonderful that these may, I'm not complaining that we get these great stories. As long as they're good stories, and hats off to Marvel for being able to actually tell good stories, you know, and, and, you know, so these franchises do this well to a greater or lesser extent. And Marvel, you know, they put in the the fancy car that's been sponsored by so-and-so, but they do it in a way that somehow... it washes over me, and yeah. I still enjoy the movie. Yeah. Again, yeah, and and but you know, the the complaint that I have is it should always be in service to a good story and to a well crafted story. And it's not it's not rocket science how to craft a good story. I mean, at this point, we're so far into this culture of storytelling that people have analyzed this, and they've analyzed it in part because of how successful George Lucas was in doing this. He was kind of the one of the primogenitors of actually thinking about the structure of storytelling in a way that's now useful to all of us. But now it it shouldn't be hard for movie crafters to figure out how to tell a good story. It shouldn't be. I agree. And and yet there are those that continually get caught in the oubliette of looking at the wrong thing. You know, telling the story with thinking that if they just put this piece and this piece or this visual or this visual in there that somehow the storytelling will take care of itself. And that's the complaint that I have. You know, I, I still really love the characters, but I'm not so thrilled seeing the characters doing these things now 40 years later because it, it's it's useless to me. And, you know, Finn, Finn, you bring up a great point about Finn because they're missing an opportunity here to tell something that we all have wanted to know more about in the larger universe. Since the very first, where did the stormtroopers come from? Right. And the, the prequel trilogy, even though it supposedly told that story, it didn't really tell that story. It, it didn't. Yeah. Not not by the modern stormtroopers. Yeah. They're not clone troopers anymore. Exactly. But even the clone troopers, it I mean, we didn't get any of the sense of the culture of the clone troopers. They now, was, they do that in the animated series somewhat, but again, it's not the actual movies. But um, but the, even with that, you yeah. don't see the origin of the Finn-style trooper. Yeah. And they, the idea that they're not the enemy, yeah. I think, would be a really powerful... Or that they might not they're, be the enemy. Oh, right. I mean, yeah. they're going to still shoot at you. Yeah. <laughs> so they are. <laughs> but that they are victims. Yeah. As much as anyone else in the in the, uh, in the the galaxy are victims, these guys are prisoners. Yes. They're prisoner slaves, and they're just doing the bidding of this of this larger, uh, you know, bureaucracy. Um, I, I think that would be a really cool take to take on it. Yeah. So think about if you, if you told a Spartacus-style story. Right. From within the stormtroopers. Exactly. And and they're missing that. Because right now, I mean, basically it's like, oh, we put a mask on them so you don't have to see them when we kill them. Right. And now they're just, it's like shooting robots. Yeah. Oh, when we shoot a bunch of them, who cares? They all fall down. And you killed a bunch of bloodless things. Yeah. That don't matter. Well, when, you know, from the moment that Finn sees, you know, he has the bloody handprint on his face because his friend just died. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's a real person inside that suit. Yeah. And th- it's affected this other guy. I mean, like... That was the chance. Yeah. And they could have gone with it, and they didn't. And then, anyway. Interesting that in the original trilogy, we're left as viewers caring more about droids than we do about stormtroopers. Certainly. That's that's fascinating. Way more, right? Yeah. And we do know that they're people. Yeah. Because, you know, they knock them out, and they're like, you're a little short for a stormtrooper. Mm-hmm. And they put the suit on because they took, killed? We don't know what they did with those guys. Uh, we never see them again. Yeah. We hear like a poop, 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 but... Anyway, so, yeah, yeah, you're right. We're like, I hope they died. Great, they're dead. Yay, go <laughs> droids and people. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, the idea that, yeah, what, you know, humanizing the robots. Yes. And yet still leaving this huge army of people as dehumanized. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting, it almost seems like an oversight. Yeah. Or, um, I mean. An intentional. You, you have to ask kind of what are they yeah, and again, within the story, what role structurally are they playing? And it's it's tricky. It's yeah. tricky. 
And that gets into the, I mean, I'm fascinated by the ideological questions of all of this. Like what the stories that we are telling ourselves, what does that, what does that actually do to us in the meat world where we're, we're living? How does that change the way that we think about things like authority and things about like trade wars or, you know, we're currently in a trade war and how does the fact that we watched a trade war play out cinematically 10 years ago affect the fact that we're now in a trade war? And I, I don't know, but it's, it's, to me, these are kind of fascinating questions. The fact that, you know, in the UK, the, the third, the third largest, uh, religious, uh, faith that is being professed right now in the UK in their census is Jedi. <laughs> You know, what, you know, the fact that, that we're now having things in, in our world, the world that you and I live in, that's affected by these story worlds, that to me is fascinating and worth talking about. And I hope that we'll get a chance to talk about them more. We will, sir. Yeah. All right. Well, um, let's maybe break here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a good place, ending point for this particular discussion. As always, I love talking to you, Matt. Thank love you. Love talking to you, sir. Good to see you. Da -da, great to see you. Thanks, everyone out there. Yeah, thank you. And we'll be back, I'm sure, talking more Star Wars in the future. Uh... Bye, everybody. Dork Lords. Dork Lords. <laughs>